Welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters, where I live stream every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. Eastern, unless otherwise noted. Um, for those that may be new, my name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We're an international educational center where we live stream to people all over the world on how to empower animals and the people that care for them. We do that through our live streaming services uh, that you can find on our website at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, so also, I use applied behavior analysis with every single animal I work with, and I work with a wide variety of species of animals. So applied behavior analysis is um, using B.F. Skinner's laws of behavior, so we don't have to force an animal to do anything. Um, because when we know better, we do better. Good morning, Sharice. Um, so a couple of things before we get started. Let's see, how do I get to the next slide? There we go. Sorry. These are new, a new format that I'm using. Um, you can find out about our services on our websites. Uh, we have annual memberships, which you can find out under, under our memberships. We have those for every level of animal or, or species of animal you'd want to work with. Um, you can also find out um, different events that we do where I travel. I do, I am booking into 2025 already. Um, our, my schedule is picking up and very happy to have that happen. You can find our newsletter um, on our website. You can also find it here on our Facebook page. You can sign up there. Um, so when you sign up for our newsletter, you will get it. You've got the last one yesterday. And also pay attention because I've started writing in my blog again. And you're going to see a lot more of my writing. Um, you can also contact me by email, Laura, L-A-R-A, at theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. So, good morning, everybody. Hey, Ray, April, Adrian, Pat, Iris, Sandy, Susie. Um, did I say Wendy? Um, so, it's been a few weeks since I've live streamed. Um, the February 21st, the Animal Behavior Center turned 11 years old, and we had two contests over the past two weeks. Um, and both of those contests are now over, but we'll be drawing the winner of the second contest this afternoon. And a couple other things that have happened since the last. Since the last time I live streamed. Um, if you, the last time I live streamed was on February 11th and I had Sabrina and Garrett on from the popular podcast called I Know Dino. And if you haven't listened to that, or if you haven't listened to that episode, you're going to want to go back and take, take a look. It's on our Facebook page. And I do believe it's uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, gosh, I can't believe I got through the introduction that quickly. So let me go ahead and start with this, the content of this week's episode. In that contest that I had two weeks ago, somebody suggested that I talk about more about the field of using applied behavior analysis with animals. And they wanted to know, I have a list of questions here. They wanted to know why I started incorporating applied behavior analysis. And it is because I got an animal that I knew absolutely nothing about. And that was Rico, my umbrella cockatoo. And I didn't understand his behavior. I knew nothing about birds when I uh, got Rico. And I got him at the age of five months old. And I believe in May, he's either going to be 20 or 21. Um, so I started, Rico was doing certain behaviors I didn't understand. And one was biting me. Um, so I went in search of education on not necessarily parrots, but understanding behavior. I first started with parrots, but um, the more I searched, it seemed a lot of the information I was finding wasn't 
science-based and I wanted something more real, accurate, and effective. Um, so then I started taking workshops. I started flying all over the United States, taking workshops, trying to under better understand behavior. And I was taking workshops, working with numerous different species of animals, not just birds. So that's how I found applied behavior analysis. Um, and then I start, I liked it so much. Um, and then I ended up getting a few more birds. Um, one was labeled as pretty dangerous and that was Rocky, my Moluccan cockatoo, and he was going to be euthanized, um, due to his behavior issues. I ended up adopting him at eight years old and, after you have birds for long, so long, you forget how old they are. I believe Rocky's getting ready to turn 26. Um, so with Rocky, I was in a little more serious position because he was a dangerous bird. Um, I was afraid of him. Um, my family wouldn't come over and visit me anymore as long if Rocky was out of the cage. They didn't even like it when Rocky was in the cage. So I ended up going back to school and started taking master level classes and applied behavior analysis uh, just to work with Rocky. And because um, he wasn't necessarily mine at the time and I was professionally advised to have him euthanized. And if I didn't change behavior in a certain time period, he was gonna be euthanized. So that is what drove me back to school in furthering my education and applied behavior analysis. And I did very well with it. Um, but I'm here to tell you, you can study all you want, but you're going to get the most out of um, understanding applied behavior analysis through applying it. Um, and I have been with a lot of people that really understand applied behavior analysis, but they don't know how to transfer it from the use of it from humans to animals. Get that out of your mind. All I look at when I'm working with any person, any animal is reading behavior, understanding behavior. What does this behavior mean? A lot of times you don't know when you first start working with the animal. Um, but when you start training it, you begin understanding um, what certain behaviors mean and what to do next. So then I started, when I was taking these classes, I was volunteering at a wildlife rehabilitation center called um, Nature's Nursery, where I still volunteer. Good morning. And I started because I was like, if this works with my my own parrots in my house, and it was, I was seeing behavior change. Why not? Why not expand to other animals? So, good morning, everybody. So, I started volunteering at Nature's Nursery. So they take in all injured local wildlife. Um, I asked to start working with their raptors, and um. I did. And that was probably one of the hardest things. One of the more challenging animals I've ever worked with was a variety of species of raptors that um, I'm working with these animals that are injured and cannot be released back into the wild. Um, so I had to condition and desensitize myself with them. Um, and I'm not going to get into all the depths of explaining applied behavior analysis, but I had to identify reinforcers, pair myself with it, become a conditioned reinforcer and start teaching new behaviors and changing behaviors. Um, so let's see. Um, then I started training all these raptors and I started moving on to training some of their mammals um, and then I began, I'm looking at my sheet to keep me online. Then I began working at an exotic animal hospital and I was doing all their behavior consultations. Um, so I started putting this to work and I started putting it to work. 
Um, not only are you using applied behavior analysis with the animals, but you have to use it with the people as well. And so on these behavior consults, people were coming into the vet clinic and paying me for consultations. And I was seeing numerous different species of animals that I did not know. Um, they're caregivers. And so I'm using applied behavior analysis with the people as well as the animal. And in order for me to get to the animal, I have to get through to the caretaker. And that is easier said than done. Because one thing you don't want to do when you're consulting with somebody is tell, tell them they're doing something wrong. Because as soon as you do, they put up that barrier and they become defensive and you've lost your opportunity to help the animal sitting in front of you. Um, so um, once I did that, I did that for several years. Then I had told my husband that I want to start my own business. And I knew I wanted to name it ABC for antecedent behavior consequence. Um, so, but I wanted to call it the avian behavior center. That's what I was originally going to do. And then I thought, why limit it to it? Just birds. Um, so then I changed my mind and called it the animal behavior center. And now I work with numerous different species of animals. Let me see if I can pull some of these up. Um, so those that know me know that I have a special fascination with alligators. This is Bruce, our American alligator that's at our center for training. This was a um, photo that Lindsay took of me yesterday. This is a very fearful young alligator that came to us about four years ago, and he has grown dramatically um, in the past year. So we're already planning for the next year. We're designing his exhibit for this coming winter and next year. So, and Bruce was afraid of people, wouldn't come near people. Um, so I began training him and that's his enclosure that he's walking out of. We're in the process of getting him used to start starting to be in the enrichment room. So I started target training him and target training is one of the first things I'll do with any animal. And you'll see my target stick up above his head in my left hand. And I'm delivering the reinforcer in my right hand. <sighs> target training is one of the first things I'll do with any animal. And target training is teaching an animal to touch an object with a particular body part on cue. So those of you that are in our advanced level membership have seen every step of the way of the work that I'm doing with Bruce, teaching him to follow the target stick. I, I never intentionally or didn't teach him to touch his nose to the target stick. But when you get an animal to follow a target stick, you can guide him this way, you can guide him this way. You can put the target stick over top of the scale. So what I started doing with Bruce was he was following the target stick and then I bridge and reinforce. And then, because I'm preparing him for when he's eight feet long to open his mouth on cue. I'll teach this to every alligator because you see I'm delivering the reinforcer with the um, tongs in my right hand. Those aren't very long. And Bruce's head, I hope, grows to be at least this big. And I don't want my hands that close to snapping jaws. So I teach every alligator to open their mouth on cue. So then I can just take the meat and throw it in their mouth. Um so Bruce is now starting to come out of his enclosure. Everybody's excited to watch this. He's very fear fearful and very observant. So he knows when there's somebody else in the room and he knows all the individuals. If he does not know the people, he will not come out of his enclosure. Um, so I teach this. I work with applied behavior analysis with a wide variety of animals. Here I am teaching a um, giraffe to touch his nose to a target stick on cue. And I was also live streaming this in our advanced membership um, on where uh, there's so many things I taught him with teaching through 
um, touching his nose to a target. You can teach um, beginning a recall. Um, so when I'm teaching an animal to touch its nose to the target stick, I'll start with it right in front of it. And then once I know the animal understands or I think the animal understands, I'll move the target stick to the left, um, to the right. And then I'll start asking larger behaviors such as come closer to me. Um, so then when the giraffes were out on exhibit, when I needed to get them back in, I would just show them the target stick from the a distance because they, because they've learned every single time through a continuous schedule of reinforcement that they touch their nose to the target stick, um, a positive reinforcer is delivered. Um, and once you start using this as a way of life with your animal, um, because if you, if that animal can see, hear, smell, or feel you, you are training it, whether you realize it or not. The key question is, what are you training it? Once you start doing this as a way of life with your animal, you will see your relationship with that animal just skyrocket. And pretty soon the positive reinforcer will become the opportunity just to be with you. So then we can break down reinforcers even more. Um, so if you say the animal, the animal's positive reinforcer is the opportunity to be with you, break that down more, get specific. What does that look like? That is proximity, tactile interaction where I'm touching the animal. Um, some of the animals I work with, like I'm looking at my dogs right now, just petting them can be a reinforcer. Um, and once you begin applying this with your animals, you're you are going to develop a very clear line of communication with them. Um, some other animals I've used it with, and I meant to say with the giraffe, I needed to train a hoof trim, but so many times people want to start when they train a, some any type of any type of behavior whether it's husbandry or more they want to go directly to that behavior you need to think i'm not going to go straight for the hoof what are all the behaviors i need to train in order to get to that hoof so through target training i taught um the giraffes to station and that's what you saw in that photo was I call them to a certain area and a station is a temporary place for a very short amount of time that you ask an animal to go to and stay there and sometimes stay still until you cue them to do something else. So in order to train the hoof trim, I needed to get the giraffes to go to a station. And then I use the target stick to, I was wanting to get down to his hoof, but I wanted to see how he would do with me touching him. And every time I reached up to touch him, he would quiver his skin. So I would, I thought that might be an aversive. How do I identify if it's an aversive? Um, is I watch whenever he quivers his skin when I'm not uh, training him. And when flies would land on him, he'd quiver his skin. So I was pretty sure that my touching him was an aversive. So in, or, instead of me touching him, I had him touch the target stick. So then I began putting the target stick on both sides of his shoulders and I wouldn't touch him, but I would ask him to take a step towards the target. Um, that way he had control over when something was touching him. Then I started lowering the target down to his hoof. Um, and then I could start, um, teaching a hoof trim. So I was asked in the contest, somebody had asked me a series of questions. They wanted to know how applied behavior analysis is received at shelters and other venues. Um, I wish every shelter would use this. Um, and once you start using it, you see how powerful it is. Um, I wish every shelter would use this. I wish every animal would go to people's homes or organizations or zoos 
um, with an understanding of applied behavior analysis. Because I'm going to tell you, um, when I work with several different species of animals and you do not want to use force with these animals. Um, you can, and people do use force. And the reason they use it is because it works. You'll get immediate results. Like if you want an animal to stop, you can restrain them. But um, what's going to happen the next time? These animals are learning from this. So with the timber wolves, um, I'm, I've been getting in with them and starting to teach them different husbandry behaviors that we want them to learn. We taught them to line up on a side of a on the inside of the fence so we could give them injections. Um, we taught nose targets so we can call them up, down, because before I go in with them, I want to teach them through the fence all the behaviors I need them to know once I get inside because I do not want a wolf jumping on me. Um, so our work with the wolves is getting ready to really kick into full gear now that the weather has turned nicer. Um, so people, this person had asked me how applied behavior analysis in the work with animals is received at shelters and other venues. And what I find is a lot of shelters don't have time. They don't have the time to use this. They're volunteer based. So they need people like me volunteering their time. And that's what I did at nature's nursery, wildlife rehabilitation, rehabilitation center. I went in and I volunteered my time and I would train their program animals. So that way there's no use of force. And I don't like to see an animal stressed. When I see an animal stressed, it stresses me out. Um, so then I begin training the animal to get all of the stress out of the environment. Stacy says Rhode Island Parrot Rescue uses it and it helps volunteers be comfortable to take a bird out because they know how to get them back into their enclosure. Yes, Stacy. So some shelters are starting to incorporate applied behavior analysis into the work with their animals. And once you adopt these animals out, you are setting the animal and the people up for success. Um, and teach it to them and teach it. Don't try to be too complex with them understanding it, or they're just going to shut down. The people are going to shut down and they're not going to use it because they think they, they're going to think they don't understand how to use it. Um, <coughs> but what I see with shelters is just a lot of shelters is lack of time um, to be able to work with the animals. But you can get people who specialize in behavior like myself to come in, teach the staff, show them how to use it, um, and have somebody volunteer their time to start incorporating this with the animals. Um, how received at wildlife rehabilitation centers? Pretty much the same thing. Um, I would say the biggest barrier is time. Um, but I've spoken and given workshops at uh, numerous um, at the o numerous times at the um, Ohio Wildlife Conference. Um, I've also been asked to be a presenter, and I did do workshops at the International Wildlife Rehabilitators Conference. So obviously, when people come to my workshops, they want to learn how to do this. Um, so if you're working in zoos, this is a must. Um, most of your, all of your accredited zoos, you have to understand positive reinforcement training and the use of applied behavior analysis because you're not going to be able to force these animals to do some of the things that you need them to do. So instead, you, you teach them. And you can teach even... Um, when you have to deliver an aversive to an animal, like a nasty tasting medication or something that's going to hurt, it's going to inflict pain, you can teach an animal to be as less stressed as possible and be willing to accept this aversive. We do it all the time. Um, 
So this is where, and that's one of the reasons why I created the Animal Behavior Center, because a lot of our work is online. So a lot of these shelters, wildlife rehab centers, zoos, individual people will sign up for our memberships. Hello, Blue Jay. We'll sign up for our memberships. And then I teach them online through my live streaming services and I train the animal right in front of them. Um, so the barriers, people not understanding it, people who don't believe in it, because there's a lot of people that I was very surprised to hear that they don't like applied behavior analysis because they think it's very manipulative. Um, what you're doing is creating relationships using applied behavior analysis and you're use, delivering positive reinforcers. And like I said earlier, those positive reinforcers will develop and change. And a lot of times it's the opportunity just to be with you. Um, sometimes people, cause using force is easier. That's another barrier. They just, they don't want to learn how to do this because, um, you can get that behavior quickly with using force, but try doing it again. When you use force, numerous things can happen. You can put yourself in dangerous situations. The animal learns how to escape and avoid you faster. Um, and it can induce stress on the animal. And the more stress the animal is under, the less they learn. And studies show that. Um, another barrier um, would be financial. Um, I see that a lot because when times get tough in the household or within people who have businesses, one of the first things they'll eliminate is the training. And besides medical and nutritional um, behavior is up there at the top because it affects the quality of life of the animal, the animal's welfare. Uh, I was asked, did it impact your experience um, with filming commercials? I wasn't exactly sure what this question meant, but for those of you that follow the work I do, know that I was contacted by a company for one of our animals to be in a commercial. And I had mentioned, no, that's not the business. That's not the line of business we do. And then they kept calling me and I was like, you know what? This would be a great opportunity for Rocky. This is the bird that was going to be euthanized um, back when he was eight years old. And the one was the major reason why I went back to school taking uh, furthering my education in applied behavior analysis. I was like, this would be such great socialization for him. It'd be great time for Rocky and I, and it was be quite the experience. And another reason I did it was because to show people, this is an animal that was once going to be euthanized. And now he's in four national commercials on TV. Um, so when we know better, you do better. Um, but so it was great socialization for Rocky, great time for us both to be together. And another cool thing was when we went um, on location for these commercial shoots, I, when we were done or no, I can't remember if it was before or after I had to sign a waiver and I was happy to do so um, with the production company stating that this animal was not forced to do anything um, and was not put under any stress. So they, this person also had asked, what advice do I have to people who want to move in this direction? I am going to tell you, educate yourself. Um, learn. There are many opportunities out there where you can learn how to use applied behavior analysis with animals. The Animal Behavior Center is one of those um, where you can fly in and take workshops with me and we work with di numerous different species of animals with me standing by your side explaining to you what's happening, um, what we're using, what to watch out for, how to get to the next stage in training. Um, but there's education. There's a lot of education out there. So educate yourself. 
start applying this because you can be as book smart as you want to be. And when you're going to really learn about applied behavior analysis is when you start applying it. Um, you can do the different steps that I did. You'll learn a lot through volunteering because you have numerous different species of animals in front of you and each animal is its own individual. So what you taught this one over here is going to be totally different in your approach over here. And one of the things um, animals don't understand the target stick, you teach them that through training or some animals are afraid of the target stick. And we're talking about this right now. And hey, Robin, we we're talking about this right now in the parrot project on how to start working with a fearful animal with a target stick. Um, Robin says, I have found that if a facility has pushback from implementing ABA, then as an individual, you need to apply it and show management how the change happens. Yes. Um, so you can start online consultations. Um, you can start doing online webinars. I have a series of webinars that I've been doing for many years. You can start going around and presenting at presenting it to different venues like I do. Um, so you work with numerous different species of animals, work with numerous different behavior issues. Um, you can start consulting on your own. You can start, you can contact veterinarians and set up a relationship with them and have them start referring people to your business. You can do what I did and start your own business. Um, or you could also work for somebody else. Um, so I've been doing this for several years and ABA is my blood type. I use it on every single being that's in front of me, people, um, animals. And once you start understanding behavior, I always say it, it can be a great thing or it can be a curse. It can be a great thing because you know how to use it. Um, and it can be a curse because you'll see behavior breaking down all around you um, and people not understanding what they're doing and the consequences of what they're doing. So with that being said, um, I was going to mention, because it's been a few weeks since we've live streamed, Robin, I can't remember the date that I was on your live stream, but I was going to say, if you want to hear more about um, training, training as enrichment, um, I can't remember what all we talked about, but Robin uh, Shawoka Sullivan of Leather Elves had me on a live stream. Oh, there it is, February 16th. <laughs> um, you can find that on the Leather Elves Facebook page, and it's a full hour conversation on training as enrichment and training as enrichment is what entered me into this field because I started in enrichment and then found that, well, because I read studies show that if you're actually using positive reinforcement training, it is the animal's preferred form of enrichment. I know that for a fact. I do it seven days a week. Um, so a couple other things. We have two workshops coming up. The Parrot Enrichment Workshop, which is next month. Um, you can find out more about that on our website in our registration. Uh, we also have our, that is not what I wanted up there. Yes, it is. We also have our um, very popular um workshop coming up in May called Understanding Behavior Through Working with Birds. Um, we don't, just a little hint, we don't work with just birds, but I designed this workshop for people who don't work with birds, <laughs> um, for trainers who don't work with birds, because you're not going to, you can force birds to do things, but they start seeing you coming. They're going to fly 30 feet up in the rafters. How are you going to get them back? So in this workshop, we tackle. It's very interactive. We, we tackle behavior issues, concerns, and we're constantly standing up 
working with different species of animals. A um, couple other things. Um, Robin, I do believe if you're still next weekend on Coffee with the Critters, instead of 9.30 a.m. Eastern, we're going to be doing it at 9. And um, Robin from the Leather Elves will be on as a guest. So mark your calendars now. Um, if you want to find out more about the work we do, you can log on to our website. There you'll see our workshops, a day with the trainer where people will fly in and spend several days with me training numerous different species of animals. We also have our memberships. Um, we have our foundations membership. It's, these are annual memberships where people join and learn how to work with companion animals at home. We have our advanced, which right now you're seeing my work with the gator, but get ready. We're getting ready to blow up with lemurs and you're going to see it with wolves as well. Um, and we also have the parrot project for people who work with parrots. And with that, I just want to say thank you for attending. I haven't live streamed in several weeks, but I'm back. Um, I do have to travel here within the next month. So I'm going to, I'm going to either do this on a Saturday night or a different date, but I'll let you guys know. And with that being said, we will see you next Sunday right here on our Facebook page in our YouTube channel, Coffee with the Critters. I'll be having um, Robin Shawoka Sullivan on as a guest at 9 a.m. All right, everybody. Thank you. See you next week.